I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a dance party now, not a, not a panel discussion. Thank you, Steve Markle, for another great film to launch this today. And Tucker Carlson took the words right out of my mouth. He really did. When he said, you know, we have heard diversity is our strength over and over and over again. And yet, when you look at the security apparatus of most countries in the world, not only are women underrepresented, but LGBTQ individuals, racial, ethnic, religious minorities are underrepresented. So the questions Tucker poses are some of those that I really want to ask today. Does it matter? Is this important? What difference does this make? And if it does make a difference, why do we keep talking about it and see so little movement towards accomplishing our end? So joining me here today, a great panel. Starting at the far end, we have Baroness Pauline uh, Neville-Jones. She is chair of the advisory board of the Cyber Security Challenge. She also is a peer in the House of Lords, by the way, and was formerly Britain's Minister of Security and Counterterrorism. Thanks so much for being with us here today. Also with us, General Janet Wolfenbarger, now retired, Barger, I'm gonna get it right, um, now retired from the US Air Force, uh, but she is chair of the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. Also with me, General Jonathan Vance, Chief of the Defense Staff of the Canadian Armed Forces. And finally, Jacqueline O'Neill. Uh, Jackie is the former president of the Institute for Inclusive Security. Thanks all of you for being with us today. Um, General Vance, I want to start with you. Um, Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> You're our token male, so I thought I'd give it to you first. Can't believe she said that. <laughs> Is it just political correctness, or does diversity actually bring something unique and something important to your forces? Well, thank you, and, and, th and thanks for hosting, Jean. Um, it's not just political correctness, but I don't think we've uh, adequately um, made the case. Uh, I, I think you, you hear Make a lot, uh, and I'm going to, um, but I'll do this quick because you told me to be quick. Um, I, I, I think uh, in the military domain, uh, which I am no expert on in terms of uh, how to achieve diversity, we're, we're, we're trying different things, but uh, I believe we have failed to make an adequate case uh, based in language and ethos that um, appeals and resonates and is in fact necessary uh, for practitioners of warfare and conflict to, to get it. Uh, I think we have spent a very long time and have been accused and can stand accused of looking backwards uh, and seeing what worked in the past and, and keeping that going forward. Uh, that worked uh, through a great stretch of warfare uh, and conflict that was state on state that matched physical versus physical and uh, all of us in this room are infused with that DNA uh, most of us are still with Saving Private Ryan on the beach. That's how we think of warfare, and most of our populations are there too. The problem is warfare is changing faster than we're able to articulate it, and the, the nature of war and the military virtues that we will need to underpin capability in warfare in the future is changing. And I think that not only is it um, required to become diverse so that we attract the talent and, and seek the, the, from the very depths of our populations those people who would want to join, not only to allow for recruiting uh, and you know, great selection to the forces, but we know that the future of warfare is going to demand different ways of thinking in different domains uh, so that we can prevail. And if we don't articulate that, if we don't continue to make the case that says, if you're operating in a domain that is becoming increasingly less physical, um, then it, is, uh, it makes no sense to make all of your barriers to entry or all of your military virtues based on a, a strictly physical thing. Yeah, sure. So Physicality do you change those has standards, some, by the way? It's, it, whether you change the standards or you make the standards appropriate for the jobs that, that you would have people do, what we try to do, and you know it, we all know it, we try to create a template, and inside that template is the perfect military recruit, and we recruit to that template. It's, it's really deep within us, and everybody else that's not in that template you know, the antibodies start to gather around them. And so we've gone uh, through that with LGBTQ2, we've gone through that with race, and we've gone through that with, uh, with women. And what we know now for sure, that that template is invalid uh, to be able to fight effectively in the future to provide the military capability, and we've got to make that case. General Wolfenberger, you live this life. You tell us what you felt the presence of women added. 
So can I tell you a little bit about my career first? Absolutely, which is pretty remarkable. Kind of bookended by a couple of firsts. So I was in the first class of women that went to the United States Air Force Academy. Congress passed a law that opened up all the service academies for the first time in 1976. Graduated in 1980 and then spent 35 years in the Air Force. The, the, uh, the other bookend was uh, concluding my career as the first woman four star in the United States Air Force. And over the, well thank you. That was unexpected, thank you very much. <laughs> Over the course of those uh, three and a half decades of uniform service, I saw great progress when it came to gender diversity. Uh, when I came in, we had about 10% of women uh, throughout the United States Air Force. When I retired, we had almost doubled that. We were at about 19%. That's substantial. Is that representative of the demographics in, in our country or in the world for that matter? No. So I maintain that we still have work to do to tap that talent so that we can best execute the national security mission that we're all held accountable for. Um, during my career, we had, when I started, many career fields that were close to women. Um, by the time we, I retired, uh, 35 years later, we had 99% of those careers open to women. And then, shortly after I, re I retired, at the end of December 2015, our Secretary of Defense mandated that all positions would be open to women. So positions that had previously been closed due to the combat-related uh, roles uh, were now open to women, and we're currently in the in the in the throes of going through a cultural change to embrace that opportunity uh, throughout all of our service branches. When I first uh, joined, uh, there were no uh, senior women um, serving, senior most women, let's say. So it was uh, in 2008 that the Army went first and we had our first woman four star throughout all the services. I came second in 2012. Since then, we've had um, a total of six women serve at that four star level. So I maintain the glass ceiling has been broken um, for by and large throughout all of our services uh, in the United States. And, and so that opens up opportunities for um, women to look up and see that they can in, in fact achieve those senior most levels. I'll give you just one more example, Jean. <laughs> She's holding her finger up. Uh, one more example. When I first came into the academy in 1976, there was still an executive order on the books that allowed the services to separate a woman who became pregnant, uh, who became a parent by uh, either adopting or becoming a step parent. They could be involuntarily separated. In my lifetime, that executive order was still on the books. So you fast forward to where we are today and there has been a huge focus placed on maternity and paternity leave. Women no longer have to make a choice of having a career or having a family. So I've seen huge progress. Um, there is still work to be done and, and I'll hopefully get a chance to talk about some of that work in, Absolutely. in, the, in the Dakowitz Committee that I chair for the um, United States. Today. Pauline, you've got mm. a slightly different perspective here, the broader security view. Right. Um, so tell us from your point of view, what's the value proposition? Why should women be in the mix, perhaps in larger numbers than they are now? Well, I think what the general just said and what General Dunford in his excellent chat said opens up some of the picture, which is that the military these days are, remain a very important part of the picture, but they're not any longer the only part of the picture. You know, they have, they have a domain which remains absolutely central. But what we've seen, of course, with, particularly with the uh, end of the Cold War and the new threats that we now face, that the big difference is the penetration uh, of the homeland. Uh, we used to take that security pretty much for granted. Uh, there was sabotage, there was <coughs> subversion, but we didn't really worry about what happened inside our society. That's entirely changed. And a lot of the functions uh, which are now crucial to our security are, I mean, there is no gender distinction in the functions that you, that you need to perform. It isn't a question of prowess. It is, on the other hand, a question of the whole of society being involved. Uh, because we are dealing now with the cybersecurity challenge, with things like hybrid warfare, with counterterrorism. And you see in my own country, we've had women at the head of security agencies. Uh, these, are, these are functions and roles uh, where I don't think uh, gender or any of the other distinctions you know, are actually relevant to your ability to perform those roles. The question is, open the door, but get people to walk through it. And that still remains the challenge. And stay in the room once they walk through the door. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Jackie, yeah. Um, our enemies have figured this out, haven't they? I, mean, I, I think it's important and it's essential that we articulate the value. And I think General Vance often does this better than anyone. And I do think it's important to remind ourselves of who has already asked and answered this question. And as you just said, our adversaries in many ways have already done so. ISIS. 
highly customized, targeted recruitment campaigns towards women. One in five foreign fighters who depart from Europe to travel to the Middle East to fight for ISIS is female. They are targeting them online with customized campaigns. They are using women to recruit other women. Their messages are, if you're a Muslim woman in the West, you wear hijab, you'll always be disrespected. Come join the caliphate and take a place of honor. Be a lioness, etc. Boko Haram, two-thirds of their suicide bombers are women. They have understood that women generate less suspicion in public spaces. They're less likely to be searched because there are fewer women in security forces to search them at checkpoints. They've exploited that. Not just terrorist groups, narco-traffickers. So think about the situation in, in Colombia. 40% of the FARC are female. And these are women who have, in many cases, commanded battalions. We're now looking at the fact that they're facing um, reintegration and demobilization options, and often being told, you can be a hairdresser, you can be a seamstress, et cetera. Nothing wrong with that, but if you've commanded a battalion, those are not necessarily your top options. Who do you think is looking at this massive market coming, coming out into force from which they can draw, but narco-traffickers? These people, these women have knowledge of the terrain, they have logistics capacity, they have signaling capacity, they're medics. These are the people that people want in their forces. and so. It's essential we ask and answer these questions, but it's not the nice to have the extra, the bonus that we tend to think of it as. Jackie, you also um, have taken a look at the impact of women <clears throat> in the peacekeeping phase. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about those numbers. What do they tell us? Well, as we, we talked about this, the issue of women in security forces is but one part of the bigger importance of having a gender um, perspective and a different set of voices. Right now, women are 4% of uniformed military personnel in UN um, missions and 11% of police. Um, women are also about 3% of the people who negotiate peace or sign peace agreements and 8% of the people who negotiate them. Most peace agreements fail within five years. And when we have a lot of evidence that indicates now that when women are meaningfully included in the drafting of these peace agreements, peace negotiations, they're more likely to endure. 35% more likely to endure at least 15 years. So you all agree that it's valuable, but it isn't happening. And part of the fact, you know, part, of, part of this has to be pushback and backlash, I would imagine. What kinds of things do you hear from people when you try and promote diversity and inclusion? Well, um, the, the thing that worries me most um, in terms of this pushback is the, the general understanding and assessment of what our, our military does. Uh, the, the population um, isn't necessarily uh, as engaged uh, in understanding what the military does, what it's for, and how it does it, uh, as I'd like. And therefore, any narrative that comes out uh, of the military that is the least bit, uh, you know, sort of repulsive, that, that would, would keep someone away, whether we um, appear extremist, whether we appear racist, or whether we um, appear misogynist, uh, that becomes a psychological barrier for people considering the armed forces as a viable career. So uh, we, as a country, uh, and all of you in the room, uh, you know, I, th I think the, the aspect, the honorable service to your country through the military needs to be promoted, at least to, to sort of set a level playing field. Now, we've got to fix the reasons why there would be those barriers. Uh, we have to address them. We can't spin them. We've got to be able to talk about them. So how do you talk about it on the one hand so that it becomes a thing, and not make it a, a toxic narrative to, to joining the armed forces. And we've got to figure that one out. Uh, yes, Pauline. Well, I think, I think the reasons why you get the pushback or rejection of the, of the thesis, why don't you join, uh, it changes a bit. I mean, I think with the women, uh, a lot has to do with traditional views of social roles. Uh, what happens in school, which we might talk about, is actually quite important as, a, as an origin. But when it comes to ethnic minorities, uh, and other minorities, I think that has much more to do with something which I think is harder to deal with, which is, do they feel part of the team? Do they actually feel they belong? Do they feel that they actually want to serve this particular uh, society cause in which they, they live? And there, I think, you know, the, the film we saw is extremely relevant, which is, how do you combine diversity and different origins with a notion that actually you all are part of the same society and willing to defend and promote it. And there I think we do have a challenge. I would love to get the perspective of some people in the audience here. Uh, we represent the Global North here, which has you know, one set of values. Perhaps in different cultures, this whole concept of diversity and inclusion isn't in, embraced as thoroughly. We have a lot of women here who operate in the security field. 
Um, is there anybody, and maybe some of you just don't buy into this. Does, can I, can I say is something anybody as brave enough calling, to, to let us know? As, as people are about to put their hands up, I think, um, you know, I've been making, trying to make this case for about 15 years now, and the argument I get most consistently is it's, it's just often not culturally appropriate. It's just not, it's a kind of Western notion of, of feminism. And this just couldn't be more incorrect. And before anyone puts their hands up to, to say it, let me just say what I tend, tend to respond with. Two points. The first is that this whole agenda actually emerged from the so-called global south. So women from Rwanda, from Colombia, from um, Bosnia, from other places were saying, we were playing an active role in the war. And then the formal negotiations, peace processes come, and we get excluded. We want to change that. They then brought that to the Security Council. So Resolution 1325, which is a dominant resolution on, in this field, was introduced by Bangladesh, supported by Namibia, Jamaica, Canada, others. This is not a global north, a western notion. Secondly, you know, a lot of people talking about culture, often they're just using that as a, as a um, replacement for the word power. And they tell an outsider, this is not culturally appropriate. What they're saying to you is, I have a vested interest in protecting my power and I do not want to be held accountable, particularly by a domestic constituency. So I'm going to tell you, outsider, who has an only surface level understanding of my community, it's not culturally appropriate to do this. Whereas you have women in every culture and every community on earth who have understanding ideas, priorities about what they want to do with their lives. Culture has to inform tactics, it has to inform how we do things, the timing, the pacing with which we do them, but it should not inform our fundamental values. And we do this, we, people use the word culture, and they often say it to, to people like us who prioritize doing no harm. And we say, I don't want to do harm, I don't want to make things worse, et cetera. But every single intervention that we have has an effect. There's no net neutral, and I would argue that you know, entrenching um, corrupt networks and supporting patriarchal systems and further advancing stereotypes that are already in place, that does harm. And I think we need to redefine and who, and, and, and made a broader circle of who we ask to define harm. But it, so. isn't, it isn't just, if I might say so, yeah. it isn't just uh, being told that you're an outsider and you don't really belong here and you don't have a role here. It's actually what happens inside communities where they believe that to be the case. And I think that's at least as big a barrier, if not a bigger barrier, to people actually joining up, is the, is the lack of belief that actually here is a place for me. Um, the two interact, of course. That's absolutely true. But I think that actually what goes on in the minds of people who are, feel themselves to be minority uh, is, is a really very important part of why it's so hard to persuade people, even when you're trying really hard, actually, to accept the message. We have um, to guard, if I, if I can, <laughs> we have to guard against um, the idea of just add women and it's better. Um, you know, but it's true. Both, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> both, uh, uh, both my fellow panels here have talked about the importance. Um, you know what happens in a culture. We we tend to look at problems through a military lens because we're usually first in, or where things have gotten so bad that nothing else will work. Uh, and we've learned uh, lessons about accessing populations and, and understanding better what's going on in that population. But we've got to be careful of, a, of that arrogant posture that would suggest you can go in and fix something in someone else's culture just because you add women. Uh, it's got to be much more holistic. And, uh, you know, General Dunford said it earlier. Uh, we, I think we all say it. Uh, the, the challenges we are dealing with are, are, are not military alone. They're intractable. There's a dimension, and the correct use of military force in uh, any sort of conflict space uh, is one that involves an awful lot more than just adding the, the face of women to it. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, Rocky Mead from the Jamaica Defense Force. And um, for my part, I'm certainly trying to do what I can in, in my military <coughs> to um, have a more inclusive force. Um, General Vance, when he started, said that we have not made a sufficient case. And we, the, the point that we just made was that if you consider cultural issues, these are used to, to, to give um, reasons for not being more inclusive. And I think the important point is to make the case better. And, and so, you know, we can't assume that because we are right, everyone must just line up and <laughs> say, yeah, you know, we need to accept the cultural differences, even if they're being used for power play, understand it and say, okay, how do we make the case better? Because we, we're on the right side of history. This will happen. 
But we can't just say people are to, you know, just accept that it's true. So we need to understand. And I think Have some statistics... Have you figured out how to do it, by the way? Uh, no, not entirely, <laughs> not at all. But um, I think statistics will help. The data will help. So the point that was being made about the number of uh, peacekeeping missions that were more successful and more sustainable, the more we can gather these statistics to show that a more inclusive force um, is actually more successful, I think uh, it will make the case easier. I don't know if the panelists have any um, views on that. Quick can response? I say one thing on General? This? So I would say that you are absolutely on target with that observation. Um, in, in the United States, I think we're past the point of realizing that it's valuable to bring in um, that gender diversity. I, I maintain that it's all about diversity of thought, and so bringing in folks that you can, you can tap to provide different perspectives results in better solution sets in, in terms of how we move forward. So for us, it's not about arguing the case that we need um, that we need more women or that we desire more, it's about how do we bring them in and how do we train them, mm -hmm. retain them once we get them in. And so we have done quite a bit of research on you know, what is it that would attract a woman versus a man uh, to, to join. And it turns out that from the survey results that we have that, that there are different salient reasons that women would, would want to join versus a, versus a man. And so we need to, to leverage those and we need to understand why we're losing women at higher rates at various career points than we are men and get after those uh, aspects as well. And I want to yeah. explore that, but I know Heather Hurlbert, who is back here from the New America Foundation. You folks have done some research, done some surveys, and have some data. Um, no, right in front of you. Here you go. Great. Heather, tell us what you found. Thanks so much. And we've done two series of anonymous interviews with policymakers, so we may even have interviewed some of you and you didn't know you were being interviewed. But okay. to connect, frankly, some of what our Jamaican colleague said with some of what Pauline Neville Jones said, People do say now that they want more data on how inclusiveness works and they don't know where to find it, which is funny because of course, as you heard from Jackie, there's an awful lot of data out there. And that I think, the other thing that we find consistently um, across gender, across political ideologies, and across generations, because some of us tend to think, oh, you know, as younger people come in, this problem will just go away. No, unfortunately, that's not the case because women and other members of traditionally underrepresented groups are still not getting the message both from training within our security infrastructure and in school and college and universities that this is a place that welcomes them. So we really see that when you ask women what's the problem, women say the number one problem is I don't feel empowered. I'm not sure I belong. And shockingly, that's as true for women who are 25 as for women who are, who are 55. So I would, I would sort of throw back to the panel, we do have a much longer term challenge in front of us and a more fundamental challenge, I think, than maybe we thought we did. Excuse me, if, I, if I could jump in. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, along with that template that I talked about uh, and that ideal recruit that kind of still sits in, uh, deep in our DNA, it's also our policy base. Everything we've written, all the machinery that we have, Everything that we do with people, how we value people, uh, what we set as tests, uh, how we set uh, our team building moments, all of it is infused with where we've been and, and uh, is absolutely uh, not necessarily uh, inclusive in its, total, you know, in its total meaning. And so uh, what we are undertaking uh, first is a kind of an exercise in shedding bias, seeing where bias does exist in a policy. It's not, maybe not just a virtuous policy and, and it, there's, there's something wrong with it. Um, so everything from uh, part-time and full-time employment, uh, great models from our allies, uh, to kind of restricted and unrestricted uh, terms of service, uh, to uh, lengthy periods uh, of, of time off and coming back with your seniority in place, all of these things make sense and I hear lots of tactical uh, response, uh, like, uh, you know, tactical actions we could do to fix things, but putting it all together, uh, and what I'm certainly trying to do is set a strategic direction that will allow uh, everybody in our force to think about what, what might we change, and then there's, I, I'll, I'll end with this. If we try to rewrite all the words differently in our volumes and volumes and volumes of orders, we're never gonna, we're never gonna get there. And so we've gotta also find a different way of arriving at principles and values-based uh, codes to live by and 
uh, find a way to communicate that without having every single decision based on something that had been written because it's going to become out of date in 10 minutes. And so there's a lot here that we've got to really tackle. Jackie, while well, you're responding, could we also get the mic over here? So, we're so I think to your question about you know what difference does it make, I think it's essential we articulate that, and I've spent I've spent a lot of my life trying to do that. I also think we need to reflect on the question that we're asking, and essentially we're asking women to prove their added value. How often do we ask men to prove the added value that they would bring to a force? And so I think. We, we can't get stuck in this, well, what's the difference women make? What's the difference women make? First of all, they're often a very small proportion of the force, and we look to them and say, well, how did you improve things? Not just did you meet the standards that everyone else has to meet, but were you, did you add something else? And so we don't ask that of men, first of all. And I think the, reason, the way we get around this is, to the general's point, changing tra training and doctrine and education to not say, and here's the value women add, but to actually understand how to analyze conflict better, how to understand an operating environment, how to look at dynamics between men and women. So you know, gender is not just a replacement for the word women. We actually need to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about things, and if I can give one quick example, we don't look at things like um, marriage markets for example, as a security issue. What I mean by that, 75% of the world's population lives in a culture where um, there's assets exchanged when someone gets married. Most of the time, a man's family gives a woman's family money in order to be able to marry. For the vast majority of men on earth, this is an essential rite of passage into manhood or adulthood. So you have to pay this money. Those prices can, can um, fluctuate and they can be inflated. You start to see an inflation in those prices, it gets harder and harder to get married, it gets harder and harder to be considered a man of real status in your society. So what happens? You have this large swath of people who are then vulnerable to recruitment um, from nefarious groups. This becomes a huge problem for security reasons. So why are we not in part of our conflict analysis and our operational planning, all of this training, are we not saying, let's look at marriage market and bride prices and start noticing, is there an inflation? Is there a spike? Because we've seen now that spikes in, in these bride prices tend to precipitate or be heavily correlated to increases in violent conflict. This is what I think most of us mean when we, we say we need to understand gender and women. It's not just can women talk to a local community member better than a man. Pauline, you wanted to... Well, I just wanted to say, I, mean, I think what's just been said demonstrates that a lot of the obstacles to the kind of inclusivity that we'd like to see you know, lies outside the organisations themselves. I mean, the general battles with problems which relate to what girls learn at school, uh, what ethnic minorities think about their place in, in society, and we need to change there. And that, I think, is a very important part of what do people feel their oyster is? What attitude do they have to the world they live in? And that's where we have to start inclusivity. So you're active in the cyberspace. Yeah. I believe the figures are that only 10% of the people in cybersecurity are women. Yeah. Well, what are you doing to try and change them? <laughs> well, that's part of, part of what I'm trying to do in the, in the particular organization which I, you know, where I chair the advisory panel, um, which is, I mean, there is no earthly reason, no earthly reason at all why it shouldn't be 50-50, no more women than men. It's just it's simply not something which is you know, defined by, by the intrinsic qualities of male, female, or for that matter, ethnic minority. But the problem, I think, lies, take cyber as an example, if you actually look at the number of girls who do scientific subjects at school, or who get an orientation at an early age that that is something they might actually want to do, that's much more difficult. It's changing, but it's changing quite slowly. And that's, the, that's where I think we, we can get much faster progress if we actually look at some of the basics that people you know, imbibe at an early age. And so and I would say that actually getting more, more of the population into those key subjects at school actually has to do with the prosperity agenda as well as the national security agenda. There's very little difference between these two now. And women need to be in there right across the board. So Pauline, can I add on that I, as we're getting to the oh, next oh. question? Mm. I really think that um, the, we need to focus not just on the individuals, the young women, but the key influencers of those young women as well sure. to ensure that we educate mm -hmm. and coach on where those opportunities lie in, in ways, in some cases, where they haven't had those opportunities themselves. So there is a, there's a responsibility here not to just target the, the young the young people yeah. to, to get after some of those gaps, but to also target those folks that are their key influencers. Okay, okay. we have another audience question. Esther, Esther Ibanga from Nigeria. Um, I sort of like what um, Jackie said in her definition of culture. 
and um, basically it's all about power. I have two examples to share. Um, in Joss, where I live, and um, where there's been a lot of religious crisis, um, there's a reverend gentleman there, and um, he's also a peace builder. And he was asked a question, um, what is your view about the role of women in peace building? And he said that, you know, women are really, really vital because they know how to engage the foot soldiers, they have the pulse of the communities, they're really great. Okay, did you invite them to your um, peace um, signing agreement? And he said, um, well, no, you know, um, by the time you get to the table, you're talking about policy makers. So in his mind, they're only good for the communities. My second example is a member of the House of Parliament that was asked about the 35% affirmative action. And he said on the floor of the House that, uh, well, you see, the thing is, these women are already controlling us at home. We can't let them come to the office to control us. So I do agree with Jackie that the issue there is really about power and not culture. And I think that what we need to do is to shift the focus from women now to men. There must be a way of convincing them that we're not taking over power from them, we're just sharing it. And if we have the mentality that we are there to serve, it's not a power thing, maybe they will feel less threatened. Anyone want to weigh in on that? <laughs> well, I, think, <laughs> I, I love what's just been said. I, mean, I do actually think that culture incorporates past structures. I mean, I don't think it's, you know, I think you can't really distinguish between these two things. And you're quite right to say that past structures you know, maintain themselves. They absolutely do. So it is quite right to say that you've got to have more women climb all the ladders. It, and it becomes progressively easier. Uh, I think that is true. And, and I would yeah. say, perhaps, uh, if I may, that uh, power uh, in, that, in the military sense, or perhaps in the, the execution of military operations, uh, is less about you know, the power in the individual, uh, but it's the, the power of the idea that what you're doing will win, mm -hmm. uh, will succeed. Uh, militaries are uh, necessarily small c conservative for a reason, because we don't want to do something that's going to result in, uh, in failure. Uh, the stakes are high. And so we've also got to tell ourselves and tell our people and tell potential recruits uh, and value the fact that major tactical victories uh, are not really about admiring the activity, it's admiring the outcome. Uh, and we spend a lot of time looking at the virtue of what we do as opposed to what has resulted from what we've done. And uh, I, I told some folks yesterday that, you know, we did a, an analysis around the Battle of Mosul. Uh, and yes, there was, a, there was uh, an aspect of physicality to it, but um, uh, a well-run cyber effort with uh, a small cyber team uh, that would have significant negative impact on Daesh's ability to command and control and, and operate would have had as big an effect in a far shorter period of time than a fully equipped Canadian battle group you know, marauding through the streets with, with you know, far less risk to force, achieving an outcome that sought to break the enemy's will to fight, as opposed to having a good fight. And so if, if we start to think that way, uh, looking at, the, you know, the real critical analysis, you know, critical thinking and creative thinking, uh, I think we can break out of this, this mindset uh, that creates for us, the, you know, this word power is about what will work and how will we win and make it outcomes based as opposed to admiring the activity. Mm -hmm. General, so part of the, the issue here is to bring more women into the pipeline, but you touched on retention before. Mm -hmm. What are the retention numbers in the U.S. military for women or minorities and why are they there and how do we make them better? So it varies across uh, each service branch and actually within career fields within service branches and uh, the time spent within uh, each career field. But we're finding that women are leaving at various points in, in all of those um, areas. So in the work that we're doing, so I might just share with you all, if you're not familiar with DACOWITS, the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. It's a long-standing federal advisory committee, been in existence since 1951. 
shortly after the 1948 law that opened up formally uh, service opportunities for women for the first time in the United States. Um, over the course of those 67 years, there's been more than 1,000 recommendations made to the Secretary of Defense. Um, more than 99% of them have been either fully accepted or partially accepted. And the work that the committee does now is focused in three primary areas. One is in recruitment and retention, so I'll come back to the work we're doing in retention. Um, on uh, the, the area of employment and integration, so as we've opened up particularly all those uh, roles that had previously been closed to women, there's a lot of focus the committee is placing on how that um, activity is, is un being undertaken. Taken. And then the third area is in well-being and treatment, so uh, fair and balanced treatment of women. So the, in the, in the re, uh, retention area, we've had studies presented to us relative to what the data shows, and which I just shared with you, it shows there is an issue. And here's the real challenge. As we succeed at bringing more women in across all the service branches, everybody, every service has, a, has the objective to bring more women, to have a fairer representation of women. If we don't solve the problem of the higher rate of, um, of attrition, of, of folks leaving, we are setting ourselves up for failure. Why do they leave? And how well, now that's pay? a great question, Jean. And as we've <laughs> asked um, all of the service representatives who come to brief us, you know the reality is there is um, uh, anecdotal information, there is um, supposition, there is not hard data from exit surveys or retention surveys. And so one of the recommendations of the committee last year was to put those surveys in place. In fact, the department has embraced that. Uh, they are in the process of, of uh, putting those uh, uh, tools in place so that we will now have data from which we can hopefully make good progress in addressing that issue, which is gonna be critical to mission accomplishment for the future. One thing I wanna ask you all about is sexual assault. Um, which is associated uh, with Canadian forces, U.S. forces, U.N. forces. This appears to be a persistent problem. General, what do we do about it? Well, we've got a lot to do about it. Um, Your this, numbers uh, are up in Canada, aren't they? Uh, in terms of reporting report, of sexual yeah, assault. Yeah. Uh, and, which is good uh, through one lens because it means people feel they're more free to report. Uh, through another lens, it's not good because there's still things to report. Uh, I just, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge Lieutenant General Christine Waycross sitting in the back there, one of my three stars who uh, started this uh, effort off with me uh, back in 2015, now the Commandant of the NATO Defense College in Rome. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to say here I owe to the thinking that she did. Um, we, you, we have had to undertake, um, we call it Operation Honor, um, an effort uh, that is far bigger far more, takes far more energy, uh, much more senior leadership, and much more thinking ac across so many different aspects of the armed forces to try and address this. Um, we have, you know, the population comes to us, uh, and that population uh, carries with it values and mores and habits, and uh, that uh, then we turn them into military, and therefore anything that happens in the military is just amplified because of the, the power structure and because of the fact that we are inherently supposed to be an honorable place to serve and uh, everything that we stand for um, gets violated. Um, and the, our challenge uh, right now, uh, I think, is uh, sometimes the fix uh, that we attempt is uh, worse than the harm that was originally uh, put in place at the moment of injury. Um, what do you mean? Well, if you, know, if you have a duty to report and you've got bystanders all fired up and commanding officers who are uh, you know, going to be uh, following a zero tolerance policy and something happens, we have a great deal of activity that occurs uh, that completely wrestles instantly the control away from a victim uh, or an affected person um, at, the, at the moment where they, they need some time to figure out how they're going to uh, go ahead. Uh, they're embarrassed, they're hurt, uh, and, uh, and, they're, and they're potentially deeply, deeply injured. And so our procedures from point of injury, uh, that moment of harm, all the way through to a successful conclusion, it, that's a pathway. Uh, that may be circuitous, uh, it may be linear depending on the individual, but we, we need to see this chain as, to be as well-defined, well-managed, and well-supported as any other chain of care that we would have for any casualty. And it needs to be bespoke to the nature of the injury. 
uh, you wouldn't follow the same procedures uh, for someone with a, uh, you know, a thoracic wound as you would with someone with a leg wound. I mean, there's every, you know, we do it differently. Um, we, we had to learn that. Um, we learned that prevention efforts, uh, they work to a point, uh, but true cultural change, I think, will be better highlighted uh, and better put in place as we uh, are measured on how we care for those who are hurt. You know, we take dead and wounded on a battlefield. Sometimes you can't help it. Uh, we'd like to prevent it. We'd like a zero tolerance policy on dead and wounded too. But uh, I'm not being facetious, but we do get measured on how well do we care for those casualties and how dignified do we care for our dead. Well, we've got to think about this that way. Uh, how, and that, because that's a cultural, that's a deep cultural underpinning that we have got to ab absorb. I could go on, but. Um, let me take a couple of audience questions. I'm about this side of the room. Thank you, Ayman Mahanna. Um, my question is about the current technological revolution. Will it improve or worsen the situation? Mm -hmm. With big data anal analytics, with AI playing a m stronger role in advising decisions and leading to decisions, will it eliminate some of the power structure games that Jackie spoke about, or because more programmers, or because programmers and coders are not necessarily diverse, or because big data is not coming from a very diverse uh, pool of people, will it create new biases? Jackie, so a couple points on that. To your point, um, I'm going to give the most basic <laughs> explanation of AI as I understand it. I'm going to woman explain AI to the experts in this room. A, basically, it's about taking a whole bunch of data, or understanding patterns, and then anticipating those patterns and replicating them because it's period. Super bad definition. Basically, you're amplifying what already exists. So biases that already exist are being amplified. Power structures that already exist are often being amplified. We see this in a whole bunch of different in ways. People think of technology as kind of gender neutral. It's neutralizing. It's a great neutralizer. Nothing is gender neutral. Let me just tell you that with absolute certainty. There's a great, great story I like to tell that um, Google was, was starting to understand through, it had a whole bunch of algorithms um, through AI. It was trying to predict and, and suggest articles for different people. So it was understanding that women tend to use online more declare or more um, descriptive words, more adjectives, et cetera. Men tend to use more declarative sentences. So women were getting promoted uh, more um, opinion pieces. Men were getting more fact-based pieces. Women were starting to get more, more job postings for lower post or lower salaried positions. Men were starting to get positions advertised to them for a higher status, higher power, et cetera. So of course we need women, of course we need diverse communities to look at AI and to rec recognize, are we just amplifying biases that already exist of a relatively broken set of systems, or are we gonna start correcting those and at least being aware of them and not expecting that this gender neutral or neutral technology is gonna fix them for us? Well, I, just, I think algorithms certainly you know, tend to magnify uh, whatever line is being pursued and usually sort of then dip down into the fractures that they can actually open up. I think that's one of the characteristics one sees. But, but I would say that, that, you know, you can take a very negative view of all of this, but it's a fact, it's part of our society now. We certainly need to do something about the way in which algorithms are used. But the key, it seems to me, is to get the women in there actually in charge of the, the technology. There's absolutely no reason why, with fourth industrial revolution, women shouldn't have an absolutely equal role in how that goes forward. I mean, and it goes back in the end to what we do in the schoolroom, what we do in the family, by way of motivating people for ambition and getting them into roles that really matter. Super quick point on this, if I can. There was this big study of Americans asked to identify leaders in tech, male leaders, female leaders. 92% of Americans could not name a female leader in tech. Of those who did, the majority named either Alexa or Siri. <laughs> oh my. So the programming <laughs> label. Your butler, your it's something real. Okay. Yeah. It's still got a long way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Back to women in the armed forces and the discussion of shares and opening up positions to, to women. Uh, this is more a comment than a question, actually. Because I think every time we're discussing this, we are coming to the discussion about physical standards. And lately, I see very many politicians and also military leaders who tend to tell that, well, physical standard doesn't mean anything anymore due to the technological um, development, which I very much disagree with. I'm infantry myself, and this is not specific for infantry, it's for all branches. Our key 
key, some of our key work will still be physically demanding, just to carry the gear, to load weapon systems, and I could continue patrolling all this. So I think physical standard is an important aspect to discuss, but, when, but I have no concerns about this. Because we see in Norway, where we have had the positions, all positions open for, to, for women since 84, this is not a big uh, thing. Because uh, I was in the US that uh, when you opened your positions for women in all branches, and I heard the discussions, and I was really, it was <laughs> hilarious <laughs> to hear all those who were so um, reluctant and, and seemed to me like they feared that they would have huge numbers of women coming on in who were not up to the standards. That is not the case, because women choose positions where they can contribute. Those who go for the infantry, they are fond of physical training and, and most other branches, or, or all other branches. But uh, we want to contribute where we are. We want to be up to the standard and uh, so on. So just a comment, do not fear to open up for women. <laughs> they will, <laughs> I've not heard that the standard of the Norwegian defense has gone down after increasing the number of women. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make just two points? <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. That was the uh, on-target comment. So uh, <laughs> as we have opened up all those positions to women for the first time, we have had to get after, in some cases, career fields who didn't previously have uh, physical standards in place for that specific career field. So there was, a, there was an opportunity here to uh, reset across all the career fields that were opening, developing those uh, gender neutral occupational standards is what we call them. Um, in some cases, I've been told by the folks who are in charge of their services that there was discovery that came from uh, going through that process, that we have had, uh, in some cases, discovered that we have men serving in those career fields who cannot meet those gender neutral mm -hmm. standards that they have now been, that have now been established. So in many cases, our senior leaders um, across the departments have felt that it has been very uh, helpful and healthy uh, for their branches to uh, go through this process. The other th point that I would make, in some of the research that my committee has done, Dakowitz, um, we are uh, looking at uh, current thinking relative to uh, the physiological differences, uh, right, in the genders, and the fact that current research shows that uh, women, in fact, can achieve the same uh, standard established, but their training curriculum, their regimen, nutritional regimen, might have to be different than, uh, than men have to get to that same level of physical fitness. And so while that is difficult, I think, for some militaries to absorb and embrace, it may be that in future, in order to get more and more women uh, who are interested and are capable of serving in those fields, uh, it may be that we need to recognize that the training and the nutritional regimen might have to be different. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a question back here in the right here, middle of the row. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit. Um, culture was flagged as a major impediment uh, in terms of people coming, particularly from the Global South or sections of the Global South. Um, I'd like to flag something else, which is in addition to that, there is also this very, very um, widespread concern amongst, say, women's movements of the South that this will result in a great, that the inclusion of women in the militaries, or rather the promotion of women's entry into the militaries will result in an expansion of the militarization of society. Uh, this is something which is, has deeply divided women. So to presume that there is any kind of unity amongst women's groups on this perspective, I think would be false. Number two, it's also that we have the historical experience, immediate historical experience of large numbers of women in the militaries, in Sri Lanka, 40%, Nepal, again, 40%. It did not result in any change in terms of the uh, very, very male, masculinized, uh, misogynist culture of the militaries, nor were they able to actually el get elevated uh, towards positions of power where they would actually have been in any decision-making process. So um, the question that I am raising is, are we presuming that there is a consensus when there is not a consensus? 
Jackie, you want to field that? No, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, I, yes, I'll field it. I don't think we are. And I think the key here is that women should have an option to join or to not join. And I, I think militarization is a concern. I think we're always going to have militaries. I always want to have police mm -hmm. forces. And I think as long as we have them, women should be encouraged and have the option to join them. There's, a, there's an interesting thread here, which is um, sometimes people assume that when women come into a military environment in particular, they sort of, as a minority group in the majority, assume the, adopt the coloration of the people around them, the behaviors of the people around them. Is there a point where there's a tipping point? You said 40% of some of these forces were women and still it didn't bring change. Do we know? But isn't, isn't this an argument? I mean, isn't it an argument? Uh, we should live by our values. I, I would say that it's an arg this, this, this point that's made, and I accept it, both, of, both, of the, both the questioner's points, um, but I would argue that that's an absolute really good reason for women entering the, the, the armed forces of democratic societies to demonstrate that actually it does not result in the militarization of society. It does not result actually in a uh, reduction in, uh, in women's status. On the contrary, that it, what it shows is that you have the institution of that society representative of the country and the people as a whole. Um, we had, I think, another question right over here. Yes. Hi. Um, Colonel Graff, uh, United States Army. Um, I, I'd like to make a couple of comments, if I may. Um, the title of the panel is Inclusive Security Playing the Winning Team. The key word is win. Okay, inclusive security. I, I appreciate all of the work of the panelists uh, in the policy changes that they're making uh, because I think for too long we've been artificially sorting people, right? That's what we're talking about. Women are artificially sorted into the medical field, the administration, logistics, et cetera. Also, men are artificially sorted into the combat arms, right? It would be interesting to find out how many men joined the military, wanted to be a nurse, and instead went into the infantry because of the uh, societal expectations of them and their, and their families. Uh, so I think removing those barriers so that everyone can contribute where they best can men, women, all, all aspects of society uh, is really uh, where I would like to see the conversation going. And uh, ma'am, to your original question, what's the added value? In my experience, uh, it, you don't have to be a woman, but, but being a part of a minority in a room full of a majority uh, gives you the opportunity to be a positive disruptor. I cannot tell you how many times in my career where I have sat in a meeting as the only woman or the only logistician or the only person from Newton, Massachusetts, <laughs> right, <laughs> who, who gave an opinion uh, and was a, a lone voice in the wilderness against the discussion. Uh, and many men came up to me after the meeting and said, I'm so glad you said that. And they're so glad that I said it because they felt that they could not. And this is how women or other minorities can be added value. We can be the positive disruptors if we have the courage to be. And I will tell you that one of the values of this fellowship is that being with these six other women for the last three and a half weeks has given me the continued confidence to keep doing that. And Peter, I deeply appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. General Vance. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> How do I follow that? Uh, yep. It will be hard. But <laughs> as to the gender sorting, that's fascinating. Well, I, I think it's right. It goes back to that, 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 that template uh, where we kind of sort by thing, you know, by our experiences and those things that, which we've grown up with. Um, I would say that if you have a military that's 40% uh, uh, female, uh, or 40% uh, sort of any minority, and you still have uh, antibodies uh, or attitudes that mitigate against it, then you probably uh, aren't, aren't truly valuing, the, valuing them, and that's probably not a particularly good military at that point in time. I don't know how well it would function uh, in terms of fighting. Um, it's not just a matter of having mass, uh, although I think a critical mass is important. Yeah. Um, we, we, 
we don't, we don't just need to reflect our societies because it's a good thing to do. We need to reflect our societies because um, a population that is appropriately adhered to its military, uh, its values, uh, and, and want to do what its military does, it's going to make for a healthier military because you're, you're all there to defend the country. Um, we don't set apart Praetorian guards to do that anymore. We, we do it together as, as a, a community of citizens that have decided to do this as a profession. Um, and abandoning that, uh, uh, you, you do so at your peril. Because uh, nations have done that. Uh, and it perverts the nature of the nation while they're trying to fight better. If I can just say, um, though a critical mass uh, would help, it also has to be a, a critical mass that is you know, th throughout the organization, making the decisions, leading the discussions, uh, arriving at the doctrinal changes, the policy changes. And I think this is now where it becomes critical that it's not a male-female issue. It is how is that team functioning? How do you take a group of people, how do you train people to be critical thinkers, be creative, and allow for the exchange of ideas to arrive at the best possible military solution with all of the stakes, the high stakes at play? Uh, that's, that's the key. And we're not really designed for that, but I think we're, we want to do that. And I we say are, it starts at the top. We are out of time, but I want to quickly get 30 seconds, very quick recommendation on what the people in this room can do to change the situation. Um, Jackie, you want to start? Two things. Consequences for inaction. So we, this is a, a positive and affirmative thing. How many people are actually not getting promoted because they can't do a gender-based analysis plus, or they have failed to incorporate women's in meaningful roles in a military exercise, war simulation, et cetera? Start giving actual consequences to paying lip service to this alone. 30 seconds, Jen. I would just say to this audience uh, that the, uh, the continued discussion about the value of a military career in one's culture, uh, in one's country, uh, and encourage all uh, to consider it uh, a valuable thing to do with your life, I think is a great start point. General? I'll go back to my last comment to the general because I think he's emulating this. I think in order to make real progress, uh, the change has to be emulated at the senior most levels within your organization, at which point you can hold accountable all the subordinate levels. And, and that's really the way to get after the true, true value and the true change. Pauline, last word? Go for the schoolroom. What happens in the schoolroom? What ambitions you know, are laid out for, for, for girls and boys as things that they can do? Wonderful. Thank you to my panel. Thank, to, thank you to all of you for your wonderful questions. Thanks.